Hello, my name is Erin O'Donnell. I'm a member of AWAKE's leadership team and also I edit AWAKE's weekly blog. I have the honor of introducing this evening's topic and our guest speaker. Many of us first learned about Nate Lindstrom through an article written by reporter Haley B. Miller that appeared in the Green Bay Press Gazette in December 2020. The story described how, in the summer before his freshman year of high school in 1988, Nate began a job with the Norbertine Order in De Pere, Wisconsin, working in the Priory Kitchen. There he met priests who sexually abused him. Nate did not tell family members about the abuse for several years. In the early 2000s, one of the priests, Father James Stein, was sentenced to one year in prison and 10 years of probation for molesting another boy who worked with Nate at the Priory. In the years that followed Stein's sentencing, Nate's mental health faltered and he had frequent flashbacks of the abuse. Worried for their son, Nate's parents arranged a meeting with the abbot at St. Norbert's and explained how much their son was struggling. They suggested that the abbey help Nate by providing payments to support his mental health treatment. The abbot agreed and the first check appeared in June 2009. Nate attended therapy faithfully, achieved some stability, and eventually married. He and his wife lived in Minnesota and welcomed three children. The checks continued until 2018 when the abbot notified Nate that he was leaving his position at the head of the abbey and the payments would end. Nate begged for help to, the help to continue. He named other priests at the abbey who abused him in addition to James Stein. The Norbertines hired an outside firm to conduct an investigation and those investigators did not find Nate's allegations credible. On March 9th, 2020, shortly before his 46th birthday, Nate died by suicide. His death was a shock to his family and to the community around him. Tonight, we are joined by Nate's older brother, Aaron Lindstrom, who has agreed to share his brother's story and to describe the work of an organization he helped found called Nate's Mission. Aaron, we're so grateful to have you with us this evening. Aaron Thank will you. be in yes, yes, Aaron will be in conversation with Awake's executive director, Sarah Larson. Sarah, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you. And again, welcome everyone and especially welcome Aaron. We are so glad that you are here. So um, I'd love to, for you to just start by telling us a little bit about Nate. Um, can you tell us what he was like as a child, what your family was like? Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for hosting me. This is an incredibly um, exciting opportunity for me to sit down with Catholics and talk about, and other people, uh, and talk about somebody who is very special to me and um, a topic that's just been at the forefront of my mind, not only for the last 10 years, but you know, really escalated out on March 9th when they died by suicide. So uh, as a child, you know, Nate was just super outgoing. He was always the guy who was up and ready to have fun. You know, we uh, were living in Green Bay, Wisconsin. We had, you know, two acres that we lived on, but then we had, uh, you know, farm fields behind us that just allowed us to just roam freely and enjoy the world that we lived in. And faith played a big part of Nate's upbringing and my upbringing, my older brother David's upbringing. We uh, go to church every Sunday. We went to Catholic school from uh, preschool all the way until high school. And, you know, we did everything. We checked all the boxes. We were excited for First Communion. We have all the, you know, the great stories of, you know, being a member of the church. My grandparents were very active in the church. My parents were you know, typical Green Bay, Wisconsin Catholics, um, singing in the choir, volunteering at, you know, church picnics and having the priests over to our house for dinner. And it was just an exciting time for us as children to be, uh, you know, both just being a kid, but then also being in this sort of, you know, Catholic school was a lot of fun for young kids to be in. So... Mm -hmm. 
Thank you for sharing that. I think it's it's helpful for me to think back on that, you know, that childhood. And, and so then in high school, things changed, I know, for Nate's experience of, of being Catholic in, in the church. I know that you were both working, uh, came to work at the Priory at St. Norbert's. Could you tell us a little bit about how that happened and the atmosphere there? Okay, so when I was a freshman in high school, I went to Permontre High School in Green Bay. There were three private high schools, Permontre High School, um, St. Joseph's Academy, and Abbott Pennings, all run by the Norbertines. Uh, you know, basically private order of priests separate from diocesan priests. So they lived in community. They had two locations in, Wisconsin, in Green Bay, one at the Abbey that would have been on the east side in De Pere, where several of the priests would live. Typically, more of the priests who worked at St. Norbert College would have lived there, or the novices who were learning and sometimes, you know, would be kept over there. And then at the school itself, which was an all-boys Catholic high school, there was a priory there that was located, you know, right through the end of the hallway. You'd go through the chapel, and that's where all these men lived in community. So I was really lucky to get a job there because it was uh, pretty exciting to be able to just go to school and then right after school I would walk to uh, walk to the priory, get ready for dinner, you know, cut vegetables, clean the halls, maybe stock liquor in their uh, community room that was kind of like, you know, party room where they would hang out and have appetizers before dinner. And overall it was a fairly, you know, fun experience because their guard was down. They weren't your teacher necessarily anymore. They were, you know, you could hear all these interesting conversations that were going on and get the gossip because you were just, for anybody who's ever worked in a situation serving people at dinner, you just kind of walk in and you listen to these things and you felt like you really had the inside track on what was going on at the Priory. So when I was a junior, a bunch of the other houseboys had left. I was the senior houseboy at that time, meaning I'd been there longest. And I thought, great opportunity for two young guys, Mark Hodak, one of my great childhood friends, and uh, Nathan Lindstrom, my brother, who are three years behind me. I thought, these guys, I can get them a job here. And that would mean they would work two weeks on, two weeks off, basically. And I thought this is a great way for them to get into the inside track at the school, to meet all the teachers, to just really kind of demystify the priest thing, you know, see the priests are kind of people too, and that they're not, you know, so uh, high and mighty. They might even swear, you know, you kind of be a little uh, more close to you. So, so that was pretty great. So in the summer before Nate's freshman year and Mark's freshman year, I distinctly remember they came over for a training. And uh, what that involves is, you know, you get there at whatever, three o'clock and I yeah, show them around and kind of give them the keys to the kingdom of what they do. The priests go to prayer and you walk around the hall, nosy, nose around a little bit, and, you know, see what they do in their rooms. And anyway, go back and start setting up for dinner. So, and I don't know if I was going to go into this right away, but it would have been at that time, like that summer, that very week that they started, that they were introduced to Jim Stein. I wow. have a picture of the two of them that I took when they first met Stein. And uh, I don't know if you want to go into that part of the story, but uh, that would have been when Stein decided to take them to the Abbey swimming pool, which would have been across town. And that was when this sort of, what seemed to be a great opportunity turned incredibly tragic for, you know, two of my best friends, so. So at the time, did you have a sense that anything was wrong? I always felt creeped out by, I mean, for lack of a better way of saying it, the way certain priests handled themselves with us or groomed us, uh, you know, where you'd be washing dishes. And many, many of the, the house boys had commented on this years after that, you know, that some of the priests in particular would come up behind you, not all of them, of course, but, you know, uh, more than you needed. Um, kind of one in particular, you'd be doing the pots and these hands would come around you and you'd just feel his belly press up against you and you'd 
feel his breath and then you kind of whisper in your ear weird things. And it's kind of weird because you just also just think of it as like, oh, these guys are just a little goofy, you know. But as time went on, you know, we really started to understand that there was some heavy groomings and uh, pedophile behaviors. And, you know, I think grooming is the best word for it. So I think it was common knowledge and not even think. I know it was common knowledge among my friends through the school and through, we hear this a lot through the alumni group, which was incredibly refreshing. And this is alumni from the 60s and 70s all the way I don't know when it stops, but lots and lots and lots of our fellow students would would have heard this. They knew who to stay away from. You know, my older brother would have told me, hey, you might end up at a retreat and you might have to shower with some of these priests. That guy's weird or this guy is a guy to avoid. So the answer is yes, we definitely knew that people were a little creepy, you know, and that something wasn't right. Now, I don't think your brain can, before something happens to you, could process what exactly that is. It might just be that it's uncomfortable. It might be that you felt like they were homosexual and that they might be looking at you or something like that. But it wasn't that, oh, we're actually taking these kids and uh, molesting them. I think that would have been a little further from, from, from my mind, although, and I don't know if it's, I know you had it on our list, I'm kind of sticking where we are, but um, I did have a, a few run-ins with different priests, one in particular with Jim Stein taking me out to the Abbey, being involved where they threw kids nude into the pool, Stein taking me into a sauna, giving me back rubs, me as a young man looking back at this priest rolling his eyes back in his um, head while having an erection and being in whatever he was wearing a towel or something noticing that and seeing him you know rub his hands down my ears and all these things and just really creeped me out like you just go into shock when that happened to me I just was blown away and I didn't want to talk, tell anybody about it. I didn't talk to Mark about it. I didn't talk to Nate about it. I didn't talk to my best friends about it. I think when, so yeah, I knew something was going on, but I don't know what, uh, at what level. And, you know, and the, the furthest thing that in my mind at that time that I would have wanted to be having a discussion with anybody was that, oh my God, some guy, a priest just, you know, tried to do this with me or did do this with me. And I think that's where your mind just says, Whoosh, I got to forget about this. I got to stick away from this, you know. But I always knew that in particular, a few of them really had predatory behavior and really were just beyond. I mean, I'm sure with any, maybe this happens more with women just on a regular basis, just because of the amount that, you know, I don't know, maybe that, you know, I see people when they were in bars or whatever, where just people kind of cross the line, you know, I don't know how often that's happening to me as a man, you know, when I was younger, but I would just liken it to like that beyond uncomfortable and beyond uh, acceptable, especially that I was like man on boy, priest man on boy. Mm -hmm. So, Thank you for sharing all that. I'm yeah, sorry. sorry a little bit. No, that's okay. I'm sorry that you had to experience all of that too, Aaron. Um, but it sounds like, you know, what you're describing is is things that you were aware that everyone was kind of aware of around you. But when did you become aware that something more had happened with Nate? Was that when you were older? Yeah, and then I would think the word would be culture. I think there was just a culture of tolerating this sort of behavior, and I don't know. You know, after, and I'll answer your question next, but I think that's the word that I've come to think about it. The culture was that it was acceptable behavior. Also, I think there's a lot of these priests, as I think about it, really had a stunted adolescence that they weren't really growing up. They didn't have the responsibilities that other people did. They were living in community. It reminded me a lot of going to a fraternity house when, you know, I went to Madison where people just, just some of the people really had it together, but a bunch of them were just, misbehaving and really uh, 
and derelicts, you know, that's not really responsible and, you know. So uh, to answer your question with respect to when did I start to become aware of it, I had started to notice that uh, a little bit after college, Nathan had had a breakdown <clears throat> when he moved to Milwaukee and we really didn't get to the bottom of what that was, but it was just, I think the PTSD was starting to rear its head. That was right before he and I decided, I had lived in Seattle and I said, hey, why don't you come to Seattle? And um, so we just made sure my family wasn't necessarily comfortable with Nate going out to Seattle because we kind of knew that something had been going on. Nothing necessarily that it wasn't out 100% about the, uh, the sexual abuse yet. So after a little persuading, uh, Nathan and, and I convinced my parents that it was a good idea for Nate to go out there. And you know, he's a young man at that point, so it did, he didn't really have to ask their permission, but we were still a very tight, you know, fairly Catholic family. Um, so we packed up all of Nate's stuff and we drove out to Seattle. And I remember staying with Mark Hodak in Montana. And that was really when I started to realize, because Nathan and Mark and I hadn't interacted now for a few, you know, together, you know, for a couple of years. But I really do, in hindsight, remember thinking what a very strange and, you know, special time that was that we all got together. And it wasn't too long after that, when we made it to Seattle, Mark stayed in Montana, that I came home and I got a message on my answering machine from Mark saying, and he had left one for Nathan at his house saying, hey, got to talk to you about this, uh, something about Stein, you'll probably get a call about it. And at that time, I remember leaving a message for Mark sort of saying, well, we always knew Stein was a weirdo. I'm not sure, you know, what you're talking about. I got a little bit tense. Nate got really tense. And then our communications with Mark really uh, stopped. You know, we hadn't really, it wasn't like when that trial was going on that Nathan and Mark and I were talking, you know, I um, reached out to Mark a few times, but it was, you know, hard to get him. But I remember then, um, Nate, is it okay for me to step to that part where we move back to? Uh, sure. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> You're I don't in know. charge. You can tell the story. Yeah, okay. like. no, I know we have a little bit of an outline and I just want to stick to it. But um, so Nathan decided he really wanted to move back to Wisconsin to be there during this trial. And I said, yeah, that's a good idea. I'll move back too. And so we packed our stuff up and moved in together in Wisconsin, in Pulaski, Wisconsin, just outside of Green Bay. And I remember at that time, we were out, literally our stuff had, we had just got to Green Bay or to Wisconsin. Our stuff was in the garage and all of a sudden a woman came walking up the driveway and we were kind of working on the car or something like, boy, you know, guys kind of do just screwing around. I don't remember what it was, but a woman came up and she said, hey, I'm a, um, I'm here to serve you, to serve Nate, to be a witness for Stein. And then we said, that's when the reality really hit. And I remember I told her, I said, that's the worst idea you ever had because I could point out, you know, 20 guys in the high school yearbook. I think I even grabbed it because we had it laying there, say who had uh, knowledge about this guy being a really terrible person, you know. So I think they quickly dropped me being some sort of eyewitness, but got the uh, audacity to, you know, serve him and ask him to be a witness for the predator. And it was at that point that Nate just lost it. That night, I remember distinctly, we all went back in and my parents had actually moved into that house because they sold their house and were building a house and so they needed a place to live. So they stayed in the house that we were staying in. And I remember, so it was a very odd time. We were all living together, just had just started to live together. We hadn't probably lived under the same roof for, oh God, you know, 10 years or something like that. And I remember Nate really woke my dad up in the middle of the night and he just started telling the everything that happened to him with with Stein told what happened with Hodak and he really just let it all out. 
And I think my dad just sat there with a pen with him and just kept writing. And at that point, that's when it just turned into like, there was everything before that night, the old life, and then that was like the line in the sand when everything changed. And uh, thank God Mark was able to keep his composure and that Jim Stein did get convicted and was put on the predator watch list, I believe for life. Um, I think he got off pretty, pretty uh, scot-free considering the amount of victims that he's either groomed or, 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 you know, I think what they said was, oh, this is like third degree sexual assault or something, you know, it wasn't like reaching up somebody's pants in a, a, a boy's, a young boy's swimsuit in a hot tub is no big deal, you know, and I think he's acted as far as I know, of different people have reached out and that's no big deal, you know. And people have written letters who are now on the board of directors at uh, Notre Dame Academy, which is still a boys' high school. They're still on the board of directors. They've written letters, you know, to the judge at the time when Stein was being sentenced, uh, talking about what a great guy he is and all of these things. And I think that's where I start to get into this situation where you feel like things are changing in the church, yet they're not. And we're not, I, you know, last year when Nathan uh, died by suicide on March 9th, I basically just, I didn't even basically say, I said, that's it. I had my son in a, in a private Catholic preschool. And I just told my wife, he is not going back. I'm not doing this. I don't care if we have to homeschool him or send him wherever. I said, I'm done. I'm not going to church anymore. I'm just, I need a break. I need a break from the indoctrination. I need a break from the lies. I need a break from the guilt. I need a break from telling people I'm Catholic when I'm outside, like in New York City, where you don't run into as many Catholics and they just look at you like, what? You know, how can you do that? Even one of my best friends who's Jewish said, does this really surprise you? You know, not not that Nate died, but that this could have happened. He's like, and then he said, and what is, you know, we were talking just really closely, like what is going to change after the article? What is going to change if the attorney general gets done? Nothing. He said, what happened in Boston? Nothing has changed. It keeps happening. You know, even last week when we were doing a press conference, they released two new names the Norbertines did, one of them being an abbot, the abbot, who was abbot uh, during the period of time when Nathan and I would have been going to high school there, the abbot who Father Dan Radecki, who's now the abbot, would have mentored under. So those type of things get us so worked up, but I'm not, what I've realized is good for everybody on this call, I'm not anti-Catholic. What I am is anti-pedophile, and I was thinking about would I be interested in going back to the Catholic Church if things cleaned up? Probably. The reason I never left the church is because I always found a way to separate the two things. I said, this happened to Nate. This happened to me. Nate didn't want to go anywhere near a church. But, you know, he came to my wedding. I got married in a church. He came to the baptisms of both my children, you know, which I guess and I think about it now, like how rude of me to like, put Nathan in that situation or put somebody who's been abused in that situation and how much courage Nathan had to uh, go to um, those masses and how much courage Nathan had when every month, you know, I think they paid him almost $420,000 over that 10 year period. And I know you wanted to ask about that. Yeah. Well, so for um, just first, thank you for sharing all of that, Aaron. I really appreciate yeah. your just willingness to be honest with all of us. Um, and we it's really good for us to hear this from you. So thank you for that. Um, I want to, as you're you're talking about, you know, these payments, I think that for some people here, they might not know this the story. So your parents approached the Norbertines, is that correct? And you know, what did what yep. happened there and how did how did the Norbertines respond to that? Well, at that time, there was an abbot who was by the name of Abbot Gary Neville. And um, Gary was kind of a no, 
holds bar sort of he was actually i always liked gary neville i think it was all business you were not going to be his friend he wasn't your buddy he was an adult you were a young person he wasn't trying to impress you or prove anything to you so i think that in that respect it was fortunate that nathan uh had abbott neville there advocating on nathan's behalf at the time when this happened so my parents my mother just who's overly protective mother like all mothers i would assume uh just said this is bs you're going to do something about it this son of mine needs therapy we're going to sit down and talk about it this happened what are you going to do and so really my mom set up the meeting to meet with the abbot and they struck up a deal and it wasn't a deal that said here's money don't talk about this but it was just here's money and they were just you know they decided we're going to start sending these checks and that basically i feel set nathan up into a codependent relationship with the norbertines where every month nathan had to go back because checks wouldn't come and he'd have to come and contact them and see what's going or my mom would have to give a call and it just created this very strange unhealthy relationship where the norbertines somehow began to have some sort of codependent control over nathan not unlike sometimes people the pressure they feel from a parent to go home for the holidays when they're a college student so that you know or whatever it is and even later in life but i don't know what it is where you know i've had friends who have that sort of relationship but um uh, so i think it was unhealthy because nathan every month had to be re-victimized and become that little boy you know to go back to get these checks on paper i feel like it helped with the counseling but i think it created a situation where nate felt like maybe he couldn't live you know without that money which to me i didn't feel that was the case i, I felt that nate you know he was always able to make money he was all he would have been able to get um counseling through our family or you know just the way we are as people we, we could have worked it out the chair sure was nice to be getting some help and but i think at the bottom line for me that was really holding them accountable because they never said oh we did this yet when they switched his counselor they sent him to a man who he didn't want to see he wanted to see a female counselor he'd been seeing a counselor for like 10 years um and uh then you know they read they said well that's great you'll be good with this guy mick because he specializes in kids who were abused by clergy so on the one side they're talking out of both ends of their mouth when this stuff is happening like nothing happened but yet you know we're paying you so um so that's how the payments came to be and there was I think there were two separate payments, one that was just a check and then one that was being paid directly to counselors. Oh. So over that period of time, I felt like, you know, Nate was just up and down, up and down, up and down with it. And, uh, but it worked. He met a great woman named Karen Lindstrom. He has three wonderful children, you know, the youngest being two years old, the oldest being 11 year old years old he had a great house that he owned you know he just he really had the american dream except for carrying the weight of this ptsd that was involved from the sexual trauma that he experienced at the hands of norbertine priests and i know we're we're going to get to kind of what happened towards the end of his life but i would love for you to tell us maybe just a few things about um nate as an adult and what what brought him joy in his life? What did he like to do? What was his family life like do the, yeah. during those years? Well, he's just a wonderful guy. You know, Nate loved music and Nate loved film and Nate loved people, you know, and he loved his children and he loved his house and he loved his garden. So just to kind of touch on all of those items, you know, Nate was an avid videographer. He always, um, would travel with me with my band to the studios and and tape the band or um, you know be involved at live shows he had a huge network of friends who always relied on Nate to do their video work whether it was through bands comedians uh schools uh who depended on him for football games and things like that um 
regarding his house. He really loved construction. My grandfather was really into construction and a developer. Nathan just loved it. He um, had bought this house, brand new house, but then, you know, he worked for the first like year and a half that he had the, the babies. Um, he was remodeling the basement and it was like a split level thing that went down two levels and he just like put all of his time and energy into that wiring. He'd send us all photos of the baby, you know, like in the thing where he was, the baby would be sitting there and there's Nate, you know, doing a little plaster work or whatever. Then he'd be up feeding her with a bottle. And um, his wife was just a really is and was just a really supportive part of Nate's life. She was um, a paralegal and she would be, you know, it, it made sense that she should go um, out and, and work. And then he was basically a stay at home, but full-time working dad too. So doing that remodel in the basement and just like neat things about it. Nate was a guy who could figure things out. You know, he uh, figured out a way to do that and also ended up with like $45,000 extra equity in his house. But I mean, he just, that's the way he thought. He would look at an empty space and say, I can do this. And, um, you know, he was just a dedicated dad and family man. And uh, it was also interesting to me hearing from uh, other survivors and when Nate was encouraging other survivors to just take it one day at a time. And, you know, some people who have come out after this and approached me and just said, you know, it's because of your brother that I was able to come forward with my abuse. So he was like a crutch. He let a lot of people just lean on him, lean heavy on him uh, for, for that sort of thing. And uh, I would just, you know, sum him up as he's the guy that you wanted around all the time. And it's been evident with his death, I mean, you never knew a guy could have so many friends and people advocating for him. I mean, his funeral was packed on the, the weekend after it happened. I mean, and that was right when COVID was starting. I mean, this was, there were 300 plus people out there and a whole bunch of people couldn't come because they were worried about COVID. So it just showed me, you know, he was a loving guy. And what I was going to say about the, the victim portion and the survivor portion, Nate was very worried about this article. He had been working with Haley B. Miller on that article, and Haley was the one who approached him. Nate didn't wasn't out for press. He wasn't out trying to do this. He was very worried and concerned, even up toward the end, when they were thinking about that article, about talking about the money, because he didn't want victims and survivors to be focused on going after the church for money which was a very interesting concept about how Nate was as a person, that I feel like his empathy that he could even extend at that time for the people who uh, abused him was incredible. Nate took the high road all the way through in this. He could have done a lot of terrible things, and he didn't. Hmm. Um, he played by their rules. He was the most honest, ethical man that I've ever met. You know, Nate, even when these articles were coming out in the Green Bay Press Gazette about what was going on at St. Norbert College with Jay Fosner and Title IX, Nate said, hey, he'd email all of us and say, um, this article's coming out. I think it's going to be really great for people to see that at least some people are being held accountable for not uh, paying attention to um, sexual abuse. This was something under Title IX different than uh, clergy abuse. And I remember David, my older brother, and I saying, hey, can we use your password to log on? Because he's like, hey, it's $1.99. You know, pay the $1.99 and log on. But, you know, that's who Nate was. And Nate, Nate didn't need to be in a church to do that. I, And, you know, like I said, he, what I admire so much about Nate and why, you know, not only was my best friend and my brother, uh, is that he was that guy. And he was a guy who could push aside even everything that happened to him in the church and come support me, fly to Seattle when I got married to my wife and spend time in a Catholic church. And, you know, didn't take me to the cleaners on it, didn't give me any grief about it. He just did it. And I know it wasn't easy after thinking about it later that he just the last place he wanted to be. And I can only imagine, because I don't really want to be there right now. I'm ashamed of what what happened in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and, and ashamed of all these men, the way they've handled themselves to date. 
that current Abbott is just deplorable. I mean, he should be stepping down or stepping up. That's been my constant message to Abbott Radecki. Either step up, turn over all the documents to the AG, or step down. You know, the now yet again hired another third party investigator spending Catholics donations to the church to investigate themselves. And what our group wants to continue to remind them is you don't need to hire a third party investigation uh, group to investigate you. There is the attorney general, he'll do it for free. And there is the, D, the local DA will do it for free. So why hire risk management groups to cover things up the last risk management group that investigated and found Nate credible, no, not credible, um, is now not on the case. Nate's dead, uh, died by suicide. Now they found that, though, there's an abbot. The abbot is like the bishop, right? Uh, for those of you who don't know about that, he's the head of their group. Um, so can, so Perspian, who investigated, yeah, go ahead. Can I pause you for a minute there, just um, because I think for people who who maybe don't know this story, can you can you tell us what happened? My understanding is that they um, decided to stop payments. Okay, got me. it. Yep. And, and what what kind of what happened? What was the chain of events there? Right, got it. So uh, Father Neville, who I was telling you about, would be stepping down. He notified. Nathan, that he was going to be stepping down and retiring and a new abbot was coming on. That new abbot was Father Dane Radecki, who was the principal of the high school when Nathan and I were attending the school. And um, Radecki had an ax to grind with Nate. He came immediately after Nate uh, with this investigation and said, um, we're cutting your payments off. Or uh, came after him and said, we're cutting your payments off. And then Nate came forward with two other uh, priest names who were at the crime scene uh, you know, on different occasions when this happened to Nathan, the molestation. And so then Radecki decided he wanted to hire a third party risk management group to investigate Nathan uh, called Presidian. They're a risk management group out of Texas. He also had their attorney by the name of Tom Olenicek, Norbertine attorney, now interfacing with Nate he what Nate wasn't interfacing with the Abbott anymore. He's interfacing with an attorney. The attorney is sending threatening letters to Nate. Um, they say, okay, we're going to do this investigation. They do the investigation, say he's not credible. Then um, they cut his payments off. They say, we'll give you 12 months and then you're done. Uh, make him sign a contract, say that he has to switch counselors from so he had to, he had to switch his counselor who had been with for almost nine years who was a woman who was very great with Nate just kept him exactly where you need to be said no nope, you're going to go see this man named Nick Hunter uh, Nate doesn't know him from Adam <clears throat> he's got a kind of a after there's been some stuff out there that he's got a not a clean reputation for for some things that he's been involved in. Um, instead of giving him the 12 months of therapy, I think he only gets about nine months, something like that. They don't really give that to him. And then he's cut off. And then Nate just freak, is freaking out. You know, he's calling me saying this, I just don't know how I'm going to do this. And, and it's, it's not really about the money. It's about the validation. I can see that they pull the rug right under him, basically tell him, oh, you're lying, you know, all this money we've given you, everything, it's, you know, it should have helped you. You should be better by now. They would say things like that to him. And, um, and Nate had made great improvements with all of that time that he spent working on this. He spent so much time diving into this sexual abuse and getting to a place where he could speak openly and honest about it. And, um, Right up till the end, Nate was sending letters to Tom Olenicek. I need help. You know, I need this therapy. I need whatever. And Olenicek said, oh, you're in a downward spiral. He types in a letter to him. And that's it. You know, then March 9th. Uh, well, I'll fast forward. Friday night, uh, March 6th or 7th, it's Karen's birthday. 
Nate takes Karen out to dinner. Nate calls me the next morning and just says, hey, can you help me? And I said, well, what do you need help with? You know, and I said, you know, you're doing great, blah, 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 blah. I said, just keep doing what you're doing. I think you're going to do just fine. You know, you got all this money that you've saved in the bank. You're very frugal. You're, you know, you're going to do fine. I said, just keep talking to your older brother, Dave, who's, you know, down the street. He goes, oh, yeah, I'm going to go see him tomorrow night. So then Sunday night he goes and spends dinner with uh, my brother's family and his family and, you know, just tells Dave, oh, I'm doing, you're doing a great job. And Dave even mentioned to him, he said, you know, if you're ever feeling suicidal or anything like that, you know, we just, you never know with people. So he just said, he mentioned something like that. So just let me know, no, it's fine. Then the next morning, Monday, uh, March 9th, he woke up. And um, we called him that morning and we were always in conversation. And then uh, I got a phone call around 11.30 or 12 o'clock uh, in the afternoon, a little, maybe a little bit later, but uh, from Karen and she was just crying and told me that Nathan had uh, died by suicide. And um, then, at that point, we all just, I jumped on a plane from Chicago to head there. My parents just started driving from Green Bay to to uh, Minneapolis. My brother, fortunately, was there. And uh, my sister-in-law were there, The old, uh, my brother's wife. So he had a lot, or they had a lot of people around him, you know, at that time and around the rest of the family. Uh, but... It is interesting. My mother contacted uh, Father Radecki at that time on the drive up and said, "Are you? You know, basically left a message. Say, Are you happy now? You know, Nathan uh, commit suicide." And Radecki called back, and I think, like, all I remember my mom saying is that all he said was, "Did he leave a note?" Sort of thing, and that was the condolence that Radecki gave us on the day that Nate he found out that Nate died. And it was a good thing. Nate did leave a note. He, he's got binders and binders of his material, and he uh, videotaped every conversation he had with Presidian. Uh, when he would put it on to talk to them, he'd put them on speakerphone and run the camera. We have lots and lots of information and lots of notes about what happened to Nathan. So um, that was, and then I know we had talked about we started to hear about stuff coming through that night, like just a lot of people sending thoughts and prayers, and, you know, to us uh, via Facebook. Facebook was what a great way and social media and everything. Just phew. nobody could believe that that really happened. And it's still shocking to imagine that it happened. And the reality is it could have been prevented, I think. You know, I don't believe suicide's preventable necessarily, but... Um, but I think uh, Nate would be alive had Father Radecki not taken a personal vendetta against Nate to oust him. You know, even the little bit of money that he was getting or the way that he was getting the money. Again, it wasn't about the money, but it was about pushing a victim into a corner. You know, I think Nate was a survivor um, for quite a while. And I think in those last, 12 months, he started to become a victim again, you know, that he just was re-victimized all over again. And, uh, and it's unfortunate. And I think the way the church handles, you hear about this from other people, I mean, maybe not on the extreme level of payments. The attorney from Spotlight had commented that he'd never seen anything like this regarding the payments, to just the amounts. It's just obscene. And, um, I think that there's a lot more behind closed walls that happened to my brother that the Norbertines never wanted anybody to find out. And I think at Gary Neville's, uh, you know, approach, I think he did have Nate's best interest in mind. I pressed Gary Neville early on when Stein was relocated, when I was still working at the Priory, and because he was a guy I could trust. I said, where is Stein? What happened to Stein? And he said, Jimmy's got problems. And then I started talking to other people and they all say, oh, Jimmy's got problems, Jimmy's got problems. Well, that would have been the first experience I had with uh, the relocation of a, of a priest. Wow. And I'm certain that they relocated James Stein and many, many people knew what he had done. And um, they tried to cover it up. That's my 
opinion. That's my feeling from here today, gone tomorrow. You know, he's just there at the Priory one day, then all this part of my language shit hits the fan with something happening to people and he's gone, disappeared, sent off somewhere. And um, I thought that the coined response from all the priests that I asked about it was too similar not to have been rehearsed or out of a playbook. Uh, so I wrote a letter to Neville and I said, here are all the names of priests who I talked to that were friends of mine that I called 20 or 30 of them and it was all very similar. Oh, oh Jenny's got problems. And it was just so weird. That was like what they, it, raping kids isn't a problem. It's against the law and it's a criminal activity. And so, Karen, so that's a 7.45 hard stop. <laughs> no, it's okay. I mean, you're talking about really important things and we, we just uh, appreciate you being willing to share and I'm just so sorry for everything you and your family have been through. Um, so this is hard for everybody listening as well, I'm sure. So I just encourage you, you know, take a deep breath if you need to. Um, we're gonna talk, we're gonna return to Aaron in just a moment and talk a little bit about what he and his family have done to move forward after Nate's death. But we're gonna pause here for just a few minutes to hear a little bit, um, kind of to zoom out and hear a little bit of research uh, into the mental health impact of abuse like Nate suffered. And so we're going to pass it over to Aaron O'Donnell to just share a few words on that before we come back to you, Aaron Lindstrom. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, while preparing um, for this evening and reflecting on Nate's life, um, the AWAKE team began thinking about the sad fact that there are many people like Nate suffering, uh, you know, severe mental health consequences as a result of sexual abuse in childhood and adolescence. Um, looking for answers about this, I connected with Scott Easton. Um, he's an associate professor of social work at Boston College, and he conducted one of the largest studies to date on male survivors of childhood sexual abuse, including those abused in the church. Um, he is traveling tonight and unfortunately was not able to join us this evening, but he sent some important findings from his research for me to share with all of you. First, um, in a study of men who reported sexual abuse in childhood, and just to be clear, of this group, 62% of those men were abused by clergy. The men reported very high levels of mental distress in adulthood. Um, this distress included depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts. These men were ages 18 to 84 at the time of the study. And Dr. Easton said that this hints at how long after abuse the distress can last, you know, 84 at the time of the study. Um, so in a separate study of the same men, Dr. Easton found that about 5% had attempted suicide in the last 12 months. That's attempted suicide. They weren't just thinking about it. Um, in another study of men who experienced clergy perpetrated sexual abuse, Dr. Easton found significant negative effects on the way the men viewed themselves years after the abuse took place. Comments from the men offer a heartbreaking look at their particular kind of pain. One man said, quote, I don't know who I am. Another said, my behavior and appearance suggest self-confidence and perfectionism, but my inner perception of myself is one of inadequacy, shame, dirtiness, and ugliness. Dr. Easton wrote that the men reported self-harming behaviors, including substance abuse, to self-medicate or ease the pain from sexual abuse. One man said that he, quote, used alcohol seven days a week for 24 years as a pain reliever. Another man said, quote, it was like being in a totally dark room and someone or something in that room keeps hurting you, but you can't see where the pain is coming from. You can't protect yourself. You try everything you can think of, but each solution only causes you more pain. You come to feel that you are not even real. You are this big cosmic joke and the only way to stop the joke is to end your life. 
Dr. Easton also conducted a study of turning points for male survivors of child sexual, sexual abuse. Um, there, these were moments when they felt that they managed to turn a corner toward healing. Um, for the men in this study, the turning points included a positive relationship with someone like a partner or close friend or the survivor's child. In a few cases, the turning point was the experience of hitting rock bottom or the sense of getting a second chance after a suicide attempt. For some, psychotherapy provided a turning point. Sometimes in this study, it was the experience of disclosing the abuse to someone who was positive and supportive. So all of this points to the real long lasting wounds of abuse and the ways that we can try to help survivors heal. So um, thanks, Sarah. Let's go back to our conversation. Yeah, we just wanted to take a moment there kind of to, to demonstrate and, and reflect on the fact that Nate's experience uh, is shared by many, um, unfortunately. And um, but I wanted to think about a little bit, Erin, if you could maybe share what has encouraged your family and given you comfort or hope since Nate's death. Yeah, well, I think just um, what's encouraged our family is the outpouring of support, even from people like Awake. Um, Karen Lindstrom, Nathan's uh, widow, ha had to leave, but even she had just said, you know, she just really wanted to thank everybody from Awake for what they're doing and for her and the girls, it means a lot to have Nate's story told. So I think, you know, from things is, not that this is simple, but this is simple. A place that we can come and talk to the community, um, you know, that's been incredibly encouraging. This remembering Nate page on Facebook that everybody's been, you know, chiming in and rallying around Nathan's uh, cause has been great. Um, the fact that Peter Isley and Sarah Pearson uh, have um, joined together with me to start Nate's mission and ending clergy abuse, uh, which is a worldwide uh, nonprofit, has uh, made us a special project and backed us and made us, you know, be able to get out there and uh, spread the word about what we're trying to do with um, turning lemons into lemonade. I guess when something like this happens, you have a choice. And that's either to, I mean, a lot of, of choices, but for sure I had two choices. I could either let this control me in a negative way or I could let it control me in a positive way. Either way, it's going to control me and it's going to have a never ending effect on me. You know, I think about it every day. I don't have a lot of, um, imaginary guilt, meaning where I feel like there's something I could have done to keep Nathan from doing this. I think that suicide from the amount of people that I've been uh, exposed to, friends or things that have happened, I really feel that suicide isn't really a choice. It's the same as getting on a plane that crashes. You don't know when that's going to happen. You know, even though someone like, you know, what happened with Nathan, I feel like he just got himself into a corner he couldn't get out of and he was on a you know crash course with the end of his life and uh so even in that i still am a believer in heaven and in god i mean i'm at peace knowing that nathan is finally free from the things that haunted him here and that i hate this you know that somebody doesn't die in vain but i don't think they died in vain i think people are hearing it loud and clear that he should be an inspiration to people to um, continue to push forward. I think if Nate were here today, listening to this from the other side, I think Nate would be very surprised to find out that this is the way his life ended. Nate wasn't a depressed guy. Nate wasn't a guy holed up in a basement. I think he was in his mind, just like what Aaron had said about that, that really resonated. I think Nate was probably going through all those things, but Nate was really a survivor and he lived and enjoyed life and pushed forward even when uh, I don't think other people could have. So, oh, go ahead. 
So, well, I was just going to say, you know, I, I love hearing you talk about kind of the hopes you have going forward. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about Nate's mission and what you, you know, what that organization is and what you hope to accomplish through that. So Nate's mission has two main focuses. One is, you know, sort of the justice end. So I'll start with that. That's not as fun for me as the other part of it. But the justice side of Nate's vision is a uh, primarily focused now on getting the Attorney General's office and the Department of Justice in the state of Wisconsin to open an investigation into clergy abuse, to create a space for victims. Um, so like when Nathan was being bullied by Tom Olenicek, the attorney for the Norbertines, and uh, Dane Radecki, the two uh, biggest bullies uh, living in Green Bay right now uh, and in high positions of power, if um, they were bullying anybody else, um, the attorney general could step in and bully as well, or a DA could go in on their behalf. I think a lot of victims, like my brother and like other people that we've been talking to constantly, are terrified of these people. They have so much control and power. Uh, the Mandatory Reporting Act in Wisconsin makes it so they don't really have to report this. It uh, they use sort of a, if this were told in reconciliation or uh, while they were at work, uh, they don't have to report clergy abuse. Uh, they say they're doing it, but they don't have to report it to the authorities. Uh, then number two is the statute of limitations, which limits the time when a victim could come back and hold their predator accountable. And that's not just for clergy, that's for anyone. And like Aaron uh, O'Donnell touched on from the report, learning that this goes on until the 80s, you know, or, you know, basically your entire life, uh, why should we have a limit on that? Well, as we dig into it more and you see the Catholic Coalition's involvement in lobbying to keep the statute of limitations in place and people saying, oh my God, if this were lifted, parishes are going to go bankrupt. Well, if people can't come forward until their 40s, you know, if Nathan... At the time when Nathan was starting to get strong enough to come forward, his attorney, uh, Anderson and Associates, uh, Jeff Anderson out of Minneapolis, who's just a top-notch you know, attorney, if he could have been able to advocate and get in the middle of what had been happening to Nate at the end, this wouldn't have happened. You know, I think Nathan could have just still be walking among us, peacefully seeing his therapist, so our uh, push with the Attorney General, and I have uh, a lot of hope that the Attorney General will open this. We, as a family, sat with Josh Call and uh, talked on a Zoom call like this, and he's great. His team is really empathetic toward the cause. I think they know there's a problem. If you visit natesmission.org, we have all the tools on there for you to write a letter um, and you can edit it if you want and send it to Josh Call and encourage him to open an, an investigation. I think without um, the state of Wisconsin getting involved in investigating what's been happening in Wisconsin, I think as Catholics we will be uh, limping along for quite a long time with this clergy abuse issue and um, we won't know when we give money to the church. I gave a lot of money to the church. My parents gave 36 years of Catholic education to the church plus preschool um, a lot of people go to church every Sunday and give their 10%. Um, it's about time that we, you know, as Catholics, um, take and weed this and fix the problem. And um, I feel like I feel like we have the power to do that. And again, I think I'm just so encouraged by, like I talked to Sarah and Peter from our group a lot that if Catholics want this to change, they have to help us. You know, we have to help each other. That we can't do this without the help, the help of Catholics. Sometimes people feel like, God, are you guys anti-Catholic? And it's so far from what we are, is that why advocate to change the laws to make the Catholic Church better? I mean, and it's not just the Catholic Church. We talked about that the other day. I mean, it's all clergy that uh, Josh Call would be investigating if this happens. Um, so from that side of it of justice, that's what Nate's mission's doing. But there's a bigger part for me, which is even more important than that, 
and that is to create a safe place for victims to come and just be themselves. Many times what I witnessed as Nathan and some of some other individuals, Jason Jerry in particular from the Green Bay area, um, when Jason had to get very vocal about what was going on, his sexual abuse, and then what he had known about me, he went to these bishops listening sessions and um, then he kicked, you know, they, he got kicked out of there by the church. So um, as uh, I think about a victim having to go to those spaces, good night, Jude, that's my son saying good night. Um, when I think about a victim having to show up at a situation that's, you know, handled by the church, you know, how do you create a place that's safe for this victim to go back in without being re-victimized? So part of Nate's mission is like an example of what we did last year is there was um, a victim of not clergy abuse, but um, teachers from a teacher abuse at NBA was being sued by one of the teachers. And um, he's focusing so much on that teacher and so much on his predator and so much on this lawsuit that they're doing. This is what these, what, what, I feel like the Norbert teams do better than anybody else. And I had a sign that was made that says, it's liturgy, not litigious. Like, because they just seem to, if you get too close to them, uh, they'll just sue you. So they sued Jason Jerry for releasing this information about Nathan. They sued this other victim. They're still doing that. Or uh, the teacher's suing them, but they're not coming out and saying, hey, don't sue them. So again, I'm kind of rambling about it, but we create a safe space. We had an art show where this particular uh, victim could help uh, prepare for the art show for two months. And he's kind of doing his own art. He's helping figure out how to design the flyer. So how do we do something that creates a safe space for victims to come and just be themselves? And they don't have to come out and talk about what happened to them, but you know, I would encourage any survivor of clergy abuse or abuse in general to look at what Nate's mission is doing around um, suicide prevention, mental health and physical health. And, you know, come and hang out with us. We, you know, stay away from your predator. Don't focus all of your energy on these people. You know, try to encourage other victims to uh, support each other and work toward becoming a survivor. And I feel like that's what really puts a smile on my face and makes me happy. I don't really want to spend a lot of time trying to put priests in jail or to try and convince Catholics not to send their kids to Catholic schools or try to tell people, you know, that they're wrong for being Catholic or that they should even do anything different than what they're already doing. You know, if you want to be Catholic and just go along doing what you're doing, do it. Um, but I think the big hope for advocating for survivors is just to say, there's a reason to live and there's a lot of people out there that love you. And sometimes you may not know how many people really do love you. You know, I'm certain Nate knew how many people loved him. I just think again, that he got far beyond that tipping point where he could have, you know, stayed here. So I really am just, I'd like to fix the problem and I'd like to fix it with a group of people. And I'd like to fix it with a group of people like Awake and the people who are on this call and, you know, I myself am lucky that my business and my, my personal life seems to be going along uh, just the way I need to. But I'm also in a place as a project consultant for Nate's mission to try to raise money so that I can keep the other people employed and moving forward. So when I meet people, you know, like on this group, I don't really think I would spend a lot of time telling all the individuals who are on here, hey, donate. But I'm certain... If they can donate, that would be great. But I am certain that in the 47 participants on this call, there's someone out there who could look through our website, see what we're trying to do. And they might know somebody else who our group could contact to say, hey, could you help help us monetarily just to so that we can continue to be a voice for survivors and victims and um, to try to make the church a safer place um, and to hold people accountable who have um, shuffle priests around and covered for them because there are still are quite a few of these people. I think 
uh, ending on an up note with respect to my feelings about Notre Dame Academy where Nathan attended and Permontre the school, I do think they put a lot of changes in that I don't know that this could happen in quite the same way that it was happening back then. I do think enough watchdog groups are out there that, man, if you're a pedophile priest, I think you'd really have to be uh, sneaking around on a completely different level than they did back then. Uh, social media, just the access to information, I feel like we've cleaned it up. But there still are a lot of these people who were involved at the time when people like Stein were relocated uh, or was relocated who happened on their watch. And one of them is Father Radecki, and he's continued to uh, deny knowing anything about it, even though he lived with Jim Stein in close quarters. And I don't blame him for denying it. But people more and more don't believe priests uh, like this, especially when you see that their own abbot is credibly accused. Um, so I feel like if we want to clean it up, I think that, you know, again, I really would love to be able to meet with any Catholics possible as this investigation continues. And I'll take phone calls from anybody or emails like we need ideas, we need fresh ideas. And I hope that maybe, you know, maybe I could become Catholic again. You know, I loved being Catholic. I have my grandmother's cross that she used to um, hang above her door uh, at the bedroom, I specifically took that, you know, I have my rosary that I got in Rome. I took my wife to Rome and we were there on vacation. And I said, let's go see the Pope. I know how to go see the Pope and I can get us tickets. Let's go see him. And we had a great time, you know, the Pope came in and everybody's yelling Papa and he's got the red shoes. And I went out and I bought a pair of red Adidas. Like I like, I liked being Catholic, you know, I liked being goofy. I liked the idea of Catholicism that I could be a cafeteria Catholic, fine, you know, but I thought it was like, I, um, when people said you should change being Catholic, I thought, where would I go? You know, hmm. where will I go? Am I going to become Lutheran? You know, it's like, it's a learning process. So I just, but the rug was pulled out of me and I have a, I don't feel bad at telling anybody right now I'm on sabbatical and I, said, you know, what I gave up for Lent this year was Lent. Every other year, I gave up something. Yeah, really gave up soda, gave up this thing, didn't eat meat on Friday. And this was the first year I gave Lent up. And I'm okay saying that. And I feel comfortable saying it to Catholics because I think it's funny. And I think that, you know, again, it's really sad that uh, someone like I, myself would be pushed out. I don't know what I'm teaching my kids right now, you know. And Aaron, I, I appreciate just your willingness to be honest about that. And like, you know, you told us that before and just you're among friends yeah. here. You are very welcome with all of that that you bring. So thank you. Um, so we have just a few more minutes to, we have a few questions from the audience that I wanted to, to ask you about. Um, we only have about maybe six more minutes for this, but you know, one, one question that, that people wanted to know about is just um, about how Nate's wife and children are doing and how your parents are doing. Oh. Um, they, I mean, people wanted to express you know, condolences and sorrow, but I think people also just wanna know how's everyone doing right now? Yeah, it's incredible. I feel like we've never been so close in our lives. You know, we were always a close family, but I really feel like we've done what we should do and we've all rallied around each other. I think that, especially with Karen, it's been a complete struggle, you know, that, my God, we all know what it's like, whether you have kids or you know kids, you know, it's a lot of work. And she's got three kids under the age of 11 and dealing with the grief. But uh, I have to say, I'm so proud of my sister-in-law for how strong she is and what she's able to do. And she's got a great big, I mean, even same thing. She comes from a gigantic Catholic family. I mean, and she's just going through this like, you know, uh, situation where it's, it, you know, it really tests your faith and it tests your abilities to just say, oh, this is crazy. But so she's doing great. I think my parents are doing just great too. I've spent so much time with them over the last year. We're always very close. But I feel like um, we're all realizing that this is not going to get better, right? It's just, it's just gonna be continued to be a sore spot in our life. 
missing somebody who was so special to us. And if you met Nate, he's, you know, all of you, he's just this, you know, great, kind, loving guy. And uh, I just really hope that the uh, groups like Awake and groups like Nate's Mission can continue to join forces and see if we can make a safer place so that this doesn't happen again um, in the community. So I really do think we're all doing just great considering things. And I'd love to have you if, uh, say a little bit more about, you know, you've talked a little bit about, you know, what Catholics could do or should do. And I, you know, you have an audience here of many of us are, are practicing Catholics who are very involved in the church. And what do you see as, you know, what can the average Catholic do, maybe including ones who are not in the Greenberry area, but all yeah. over the country? What do you think Catholics can do to make our church safer, to, to help people like Nate? Well, I think that, you know, so I, I think like what we're doing for Wisconsin is contacting the attorney general. If you're in a state where there hasn't been an investigation to remove, you know, statute of limitation laws, write your attorney general, write your politicians, write your local DAs, and then get involved at the ground level. Peter Isley, who's been helping me a lot from SNAP, who's now a member of our company, uh, said, when you give money to the church, go in and ask for them to show the documents, you know, of what they have with respect to the diocese. Try to use your influence within the church to make it better. You're funding the church. While the church isn't a co-op, the church can't survive without us. And just as your parents probably did to you or whoever it was, or your boss or whoever, if you want to get money, you have to do what they want you to do. And I feel like Catholics have way more power than they think. And it's high time that we take the power back. Uh, and I think financial is, is a big part of the church to have better one-on-one -on -one conversations. Tell your pastor, talk to the people who are involved in your church about Nate, Nate's mission and other things that you read about uh, in your local um, community or diocese. Because this is a worldwide epidemic and, and it's, you know, it's not going away necessarily. I think it's still just feels like it's still coming to the surface. So I think that's something that I would encourage all Catholics to do. And then with respect to, um, you know, when you see people who are hurting, I think Catholics probably do this already innately, you know, it's just encourage people to um, get help, to continue to see people. I mean, I would say the, the one downside is that, like with Nate, if we really look at what they say about surrounding somebody with love when they're in that state, Nathan was surrounded by that cocoon of love. I mean, he could not have been more surrounded. I mean, we talk about that a lot. So I would just say, you know, partly with the alcohol and drug abuse and, you know, uh, that Aaron was talking about that people do to, to numb the pain, I would say the more we can be involved in a church and in a community that helps each other, you know, um, the better we'll be. So, I mean, that's what Nate's mission's doing, and it makes me feel better daily to try to help people and to see people come out of the woodwork um, who want to help us and to do something that really matters. So, Thank you. Uh, we have more questions, but I think that is a really great way to end. So thank you, you know, for those encouraging words as well. Um, and we're just really, really grateful for you being here and for being willing to talk about your brother and to all your family members and friends that are here as well. Just we're grateful for you being willing to share your story and be here with us.